Hello Mike J, our first ever returning guest, last seen in 2019, or should I say 1799, and it's a real pleasure to have you back. You're a cultural historian and one of the world's foremost experts on the role drugs have played in society and such things. Your new book, Psychonauts, which I have right beside me now, has recently been published to lots of acclaim. I'm going to ask you more about the book in just one moment, but first of all, could I loop back on that very troublesome word, drugs? Could you explain to our listeners, please, the deeper historical meaning of the word drugs, which is kind of lost to us today? Yes, it is. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here and a great, great privilege to be back. Yes, I mean, I think I'm probably fairly typical of all of us in uh, growing up, assuming that uh, drugs, as we call them, kind of appeared in the 1960s and that prior to that, there was wasn't really a history of them. They'd either, you know, been banned or hadn't existed or whatever. So it's surprising to discover that uh, the word drugs, as we're going to use it now, meaning intoxicating or illegal or whatever um, type of drugs, is actually a creation of the 20th century and didn't exist before that and actually couldn't really exist before that because before that, the word drugs just meant all medications, anything a doctor would give you or that you'd find in a pharmacy. I mean, we still have that use of the word in super drug, for example. Uh, but a lot of what we call drugs these days, you would have found on those pharmacy shelves. So cocaine or cannabis or heroin. So in going back to 1885, we're going to go back to a world where drugs, in the sense that we're using it now, um, don't exist. But I'm sure we'll use them anachronistically because uh, it's a, a useful term to have for us these days. OK, well, before we get into the history, there's something I really have to ask you about, which is the contemporary relevance of, of drugs. And this is something you actually begin the book with a, an account of how things have changed throughout your own writing and researching career. There's a renewed interest in psychedelics today. Prince Harry's famously spoken about how ayahuasca has helped him come to terms with the death of his mother. There's all the work of Michael Pollan, of course, and um, Sapo, which is the psychedelic toad venom, mm -hmm. has, uh, has been called the new trendy hallucinogenic. Uh, so much has changed just recently. And I just wanted to kind of get your perspective on that. And um, if you saw it coming or or what? Yeah, I mean, it's... Um... I mean, it, it, it's commercially driven, of course. There are literally billions of dollars being pumped into licensing these psychedelics as pharmaceuticals, making them part of um, clinical medicine and therapy. I think that's where our conversation is at the moment. I, I suspect that our conversation is going to move beyond that into the other roles that they might play in society. But in terms of my the perspective I want to bring, the narrative that accompanies this is that psychedelics and, you know, generally the exploration of the mind and mystical experience on drugs was something that uh, suddenly started in the 1960s and that nobody, you know, in Western science or culture had ever thought much about that before. And that by the end of the 1960s, it had all been um, discredited or banned or driven underground or whatever. And uh, now it's suddenly bouncing back. But I think um, that's a sort of, um, you know, that's a false periodization. I mean, partly because the word psychedelic wasn't coined until the 1950s. So we tend to assume that that's where the story starts. But uh, the story that I'm uh, outlining in Psychonauts is one where actually right back to the very beginnings of the scientific revolution and the Royal Society, uh, scientists and the broader um, culture have been very aware that mind-altering drugs tell us extraordinary things about the mind and reality and our place in it. And uh, that all the way up and until the 20th century, the natural way to investigate this was to take these drugs yourself and uh, describe and uh, write about the experience. So I think um, what we're doing now is not just picking on, on something that suddenly emerged in the 1960s, we're uh, rejoining a sort of longer, deeper stream of uh, interest and investigation into all this. Well, you mentioned there the word psychedelics is, I mean, we're full of tricky words here, haven't we, mm. the drug psychedelics, but um, let's Let's go on to the next one, psychonauts, mm -hmm. um, which is a very enticing word in a way. It sounds a bit like an astronaut. It does. Um, <laughs> 
But um, could you tell us where you found that word and why you think it applies so well to your subject that it's that it's there on the front of the book? And and also maybe just talk about Psychonauts, the book and what you were what you were trying to do. Where's the central area of focus in that book? Right. Well, the word psychonaut, you hear it quite a lot these days, mostly from people taking psychedelics and applying it to themselves. Uh, it was coined by the German novelist Ernst Junger in a novel that he wrote just post-war in 1949. And it's a futuristic novel in which he imagines a cadre of scientists in the future who are synthesizing new drugs and using them to explore the hidden regions of the mind. And uh, when you hear it used these days, it tends to mean something, you know, something of a rebel or a renegade, because of course, within institutional science, uh, people like uh, neuroscientists and psychopharmacologists uh, don't take the drugs that they're studying. But I kind of wanted to reclaim it and take it back to this um, period in the 18th and 19th century, when, as I've mentioned, uh, this was all standard practice. There wasn't a word at the time. I mean, the word that was widely used was uh, self-experimentation. You know, it was an era of self-experiment in science. So self-experimentation at that time didn't necessarily mean taking drugs. It could equally, uh, in your new book, passing strong electric currents through your body to see what happens, or even performing surgery on yourself or inhaling toxic gases. You know, scientists were uh, pretty gung-ho in those days. And actually, drugs were the least of it. You know, self-experimenting with drugs was pretty safe because, uh, you know, these were doctors and scientists who knew to start with low doses and have sterilized needles and all these other basic precautions. But I thought it would be um, a really good way of getting back to this forgotten period of drug experimentation uh, by looking at the practice of self-experiment. So I've kind of put that at the center of the book and Psychonauts on the cover for that reason. I mean, it's a very interesting practice. It's a very interesting type of science that we don't really have anymore. If you're self-experimenting, you're kind of fusing the roles of observer and subject. You're conducting the experiment, but you're also the subject who's being experimented on. So do you try and produce something that's as objective and data-driven as possible? Or do you, you know, particularly when you're talking about drugs that affect consciousness, do you really try to describe, you know, in the first person how that feels? And there's always a balance, a sort of slider or a toggle between these two. And so that makes it a fascinating practice to follow and to place at the centre of the book. Mm. I think also I should say Psychonauts is probably better on the front of a book than self-experimentation. Yes, exactly. it's (laughs) it's, It's got a bit of vim and um the idea of the pioneer, like yes. the astronaut or the aeronaut or the psychonaut, it's it's a nice idea of voyaging inside the mind. It's got a, these romantic overtones, I suppose. And um, as as you mentioned there, that the, the primary the primary focus chronologically is, um, shall we say, towards the end of the nineteenth century, mm-hmm. early twentieth century. Lots of interest there. Goes right back though to 1660 and the foundation of the Royal Society, which you pinpoint as a really important moment in the history of science and this idea of self-experimentation that um watchword of the the, the royal society mm-hmm. the, the motto nullius in verba take no one's word for it do you want to say something about that very early moment in the 1660s when people started to use themselves for experimentation. Yes, as you say, it it goes right back to that moment when experiment becomes the source of uh, scientific knowledge or evidence. And experiments, of course, have to be witnessed and they have to be uh, repeated and uh, demonstrated and proved by repetition. And uh, in the Royal Society, there was a little uh, book where if you'd attended and watched an experiment, you wrote your comments and you said, yes, I saw this experiment I affirm or approve this result. But it was obvious also from the beginning that there were some classes of evidence that couldn't be demonstrated in this way. And people like Boyle and Newton talked about primary and secondary qualities. And primary qualities were things, you know, like weight or mass or things that could be measured. But secondary qualities were... um, 
things that were only available to the observer, perceptions and sensations and so on. And you couldn't discount these. They were important for science. Uh, I guess the famous one of Isaac Newton is not taking drugs, but it's a very similar principle when he's uh, investigating light and colour. He notices that if you stick your finger into your, behind your eyeball, into your eye socket, you get all kinds of strange colours and visual distortions. And he performs that as a self-experiment and uh, writes it up, including a diagram of uh, what he's done. He's taken what he calls a bodkin, like a knitting needle, and stuck it behind his eyeball. And he notes that he's, if he dents the curvature of the eyeball, then you get visual distortions. And he's keyed this picture with uh, letters A, B, C, D, E, so that other people can repeat it. So that's an example of a phenomenon which can be correctly reported. You know, there's a difference between uh, making things up and reporting them correctly, but it can't really be demonstrated because these colours are only in Newton's head. So you have to find a way of dealing with that. Mm. And also justifies your, your point earlier in a way that drugs were the least of it, because when you're sticking <laughs> essentially knitting needles in your eyes, I should say no one try this at <laughs> Absolutely. Um, we are verging on the very dangerous, aren't we, yeah, at this point? Just say no. <laughs> um, OK, I should just ask you this question about subjectivity and objectivity, because it's such an interesting one in science, because science likes to produce the most solid theories that can be testable, that can be falsified. Obviously, this is just an impossibility with um, a lot of what you're dealing with today, especially with people's experiences of taking drugs. How did how did scientists react or respond to this problem? Could you talk generally? I know we're going to look more specifically in a moment, but mm -hmm. was there anything in particular that they did? Yes, well, I mean, by the 18th century, when people were experimenting with drugs, there was a, a protocol was quite well established, which we recognise today, you know, 8.15pm took, you know, 30 milligrams of X, you know, 30 minutes later started to notice the effect, took my pulse, it was reading X, you know. So that's a sort of search for objective data and measurement. And in the 19th century, that starts to get a bit more codified with sort of positivist ideas of science, which kind of at the beginning with... Um, people like Auguste Comte, you know, the first positivist um, philosophers, say, well, there can't be a science of the mind because uh, mental events are not evidence. Everybody just reports what they feel and they're probably different from what everybody else feels. So, you know, that kind of idea of positivist science really cuts all this kind of investigation off at the knees. And at the same time as that's happening, you've got uh, a kind of Countercurrent of romantic science, which really starts, I think, with Humphrey Davy and his nitrous oxide experiments in Bristol and then Thomas de Quincey. So you get both these strands developing through the 19th century. And uh, the word objectivity doesn't really emerge until about uh, 1850. And you, then you have the idea of a trained observer, the idea that it's the job of a scientist to be able to reliably report these kinds of things. But at the same time, there are more and more of these brass instruments that measure uh, stimulus and response and reaction time. And uh, when psychology emerges as a discipline in the late 19th century, the mainstream of it is very much fixated around this kind of objective um, physical measurement, extracting data from mental events. But then there are also what we might call introspective, um, you know, more philosophical subjects like William James, who are much more interested in the experience of consciousness. So you have both these two strands, you know, one that we might call objective and the other that we might call subjective, both uh, developing and uh, expanding all the way through this period. Yeah, and I should say, um, as a reader, one of the great pleasures of the book is actually tracing this story through the chapters which are just full of accounts of experience and you're trying to frame the experience within the context of what's happening at the time I think that's one of the the really interesting things for the reader because there's often the experiences themselves quite dramatic they're sometimes um, poetic almost and they're certainly vivid but of course then they have to be understood in their own social setting mm -hmm. and so on um, we're going to go now and have a look at um, the history a little bit more closely and this begins with me asking you a question and the question is this if you could travel back through time mike j 
which calendar year would you like to go and visit? That's a very good question. And after much deliberation, I've chosen 1885. Okay. Now, listen, uh, great choice. 1880s probably strike people immediately as a time of high Victorian society. The world's becoming more global. There's a I suppose, a sense of growing confidence in the West, but that also that uh, scientific dogmatism, which is everywhere from eugenics to, I don't know, it's just it's mm-hmm. very prevalent. But there's one thing in particular that you write about that I wanted to ask um, you to talk about, which is something that was becoming part of everyday life, which is the new modern pharmacy mm-hmm. that was appearing on the streets of Victorian Britain, in a way that had never quite been seen before. So to begin with, would you be able just to take us into one of these pharmacies and tell us the kind of things in 1885 that you'd be able to look at and maybe buy if you were fancying them? Yes, I think this is uh, this is crucial to the story. This is one of the things that makes 1885 is really the beginning of this point where the both the fascinations and the dangers of drugs are being ramped up as we head towards the 20th century. So uh, for a previous generation, a pharmacy would have been a shop with uh, bottles of uh, powders and apothecaries, uh, you know, putting them into little paper packets. But by this time, we're starting to get the modern pharmacy, which is an amazing sort of temple to consumerism. You start to get those, um, we still see them today in the sort of front of pharmacies, carboys, they're called. They're those uh, strange um, sort of oriental shaped glass bottles, usually filled with coloured liquid, which uh, sit on the shelves in the window and uh, promise all kinds of, uh, you know, fascinating and exotic new technologies with a little hint of the, the oriental souk about them. And and when you went into a pharmacy, instead of just having these uh, unbranded uh, bottles of powder, you'd now have all kinds of pills and lozenges and tabloids, as they were called. That was a term uh, patented by Burroughs Welcome, who were one of the leaders in producing this uh, new highly branded pharmacy. And people are starting to link particular uh, conditions with particular pills with more precision. Ah, here's a new pill that's specifically uh, targeted for, um, you know, stomach cramps or sinus infections or whatever. So uh, the pharmacy is a a zone of um, enormous promise and fascination and, you know, quite futuristic, I think. But it's also... uh, a zone of danger because there are dozens of these patent medicine preparations which are often branded with very um, reassuring, you know, Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup or whatever, which actually probably contain quite large amounts of uh, opium and morphine and increasingly cocaine. There are no ingredients on them. Nothing is, uh, uh, there's very little regulation around this. So people also have the sense that the pharmaceutical industry, big pharma as we would call it these days, is getting more and more prevalent, richer and richer, pumping out more and more stronger and more concentrated drugs. And uh, there's nobody really overseeing this process. So both the promises and the dangers of drugs, are, I think, sort of very visible in the late Victorian pharmacy. Yeah, I suppose the question, well, the central points here are about access and potency in a way, aren't they? Because if you have I don't know, Mother Hubbard's special mixture and it's full of um, things that can can blast your head in smithery. I mean, that's one one point, but it is just the fact that you can walk in and pick them up. And I suppose in a way, the, one of our touchstones culturally for this would be Coca-Cola, wouldn't it? Which is um, obviously a, everywhere now mm-hmm. nowadays, but it started off in this kind of age and uh, maybe a little bit later on, I'm not quite sure. You'll tell me in a moment. Mm-hmm. But it did have a bit of powerful ingredient, didn't it? It certainly did. And what it didn't have was alcohol. Because when we talk about 
drugs in our modern use of the term, that tends not to include alcohol. But uh, if you remember the temperance movement, which is really building at this point, you know, a lot of people are concerned about these patent medicines, as you say, because they had uh, unspecified numbers of ingredients in them that were kind of euphorious and would make you feel better without quite knowing why. But another reason a lot of people were concerned about was they had such large amounts of alcohol in. You know, they were 60% proof in many cases. Cases. Alcohol is, for many people, the most concerning of all these drugs. So when um, Coca-Cola was first developed uh, in, uh, in Georgia by John Pemberton, uh, there were lots of dry states. Alcohol and bars were uh, sort of moving a bit down market, and it was initially marketed as the temperance drink. So the great thing about Coca-Cola was it was the drink, as in a way it still is, that you can go into a bar, and if you don't want an alcoholic drink, well, there's Coca-Cola, and it was marketed marketed as the great invigorator, something that would make you smarter, a sort of uh, a kind of energy booster and um, cognitive enhancer. It's, um, I'm, I'm smiling to myself here because I'm thinking of all these moments in Victorian literature where you, you see someone have a shot of some um, elixir and it makes them shoot up out of bed and they're better <laughs> in a few minutes. And it obviously seems really bizarre to us today, but when, when you know what they might have if you imagine what they might have been drinking, it does make a bit of a, a bit of sense, I suppose. Anyway, let's get on to your scenes. We've got three scenes we're going to look at in 1885. They tell a real story in themselves. Great choices. Where are we going to go to begin with, please, Mike? Well, I think we'll start in January and we'll go to Vienna and we'll be in the sort of rather seedy, shabby, dingy uh, student rooms of the young medical scientist Sigmund Freud. He will have uh, on his desk a copy of his latest paper on cocaine, with, which is called Contribution to the Knowledge of the Effect of Cocaine. Not a very snappy title. And he'll almost certainly also have on his desk a little bottle of uh, Merck Pharmaceuticals cocaine. We could, um, if we want a snappier title, we could definitely call Freud a psychonaut, couldn't we? Because that's kind of what he is at the moment. Is that right? Yes, I think that. I mean, he called himself a conquistador of the mind, or that was his ambition for himself. So that captures that same sense of pioneering exploration. So Freud and cocaine. Mm -hmm. He's just published his paper, which is doubtless drawn on um, self-experimentation. Do you want to tell us a little bit about this story, which I know he was quite keen to conceal later on in his career. But at this point in 1885, he was very, very interested in Yes. During the 20th century, of course, Freud became, you know, the great towering figure of, uh, you know, the unconscious and psychoanalysis and cocaine became this demonised drug. In 1885, neither of these are the case. Neither of them are very well known. So we have to shake off all those kind of, uh, all, all that hindsight, which is very, very difficult um, to do. But I think it reveals a fascinating story. Freud, like many people at the time, diagnoses himself as suffering from neurasthenia, which is the sort of great nervous disease of the age that everybody was suffering from. And it was, I don't know, probably um, the sort of thing that we might today call burnout, but it might also include elements of anxiety and depression. And it was generally a feeling that modern life had become too fast and, uh, you know, the human mind and frame didn't have enough energy to keep up. So everybody was very interested in the idea of a nervous stimulant that might, uh, you know, allow people to uh, approach life with more energy if they were working two jobs or long shifts or trying to keep up with the machine in the industrial age. And that's Freud's interest in cocaine initially. And he wrote, he'd written a paper about it the previous year on cocaine in which he described its um, subjective effects on himself in the first person. And a very fine literary style, actually. It's a style that uh, Freud never really used subsequently. And this paper that's sitting on his desk at the moment is the follow-up. And what he's noticed is that his subjective response to cocaine is not the same as everybody else's. He's been trying it on sort of his fellow medical students. Uh, he feels this wonderful euphoria that he's described and great um, energy, and he finds it incredibly useful for work and for his mental health. But he's noticed that other people have very different 
responses. Often they feel a bit nauseous or it makes them a bit anxious. So he's looking for some way of um, establishing objectively what cocaine does. So what he's been doing for this new paper is something he never ever did again in his career, was actually experiment on human beings, including himself. He had a machine called a dynamometer, which measured the muscular strength that you could exert. And he wanted to use this to prove that uh, it wasn't just a subjective feeling that you had more energy, that you actually did. And so he'd been doing systematic trials of himself on cocaine, pounding this dynamometer, and he'd established, you know, it was no illusion. He actually could exert, you know, more muscular force for a greater period of time when he was on cocaine. But the other thing that he noticed was that uh, this effect seemed to start almost immediately as soon as you'd taken the drug, when you first felt that moment of euphoria, that mental lift. And actually before most of the cocaine had got into the bloodstream. So the theory that he was proposing in this paper was that it was actually the mental effect of the cocaine, the euphoria that unlocked this energy. It wasn't a straight, simple motor stimulant. In some ways, it was uh, the elevated state of mind that it produced uh, had a physical effect on the body and on the level of energy. Mm. A practical question. How was Freud taking his cocaine at the moment? Am I right in thinking that he was putting it in a solution of water? Is that correct? Yes, that's a very good question. That's what he started off doing. He first of all got it from Merck Pharmaceuticals, who was a German supplier. It was quite expensive, but he went ahead with it anyway. And as you say, he dissolved it in water and drank it and described how it made his... Uh, it was a local anaesthetic and it made his lips feel warm and his throat feel cold as he as he drank it. But just about at this... Um, point he'd uh, because it was expensive and he'd established that you know it was a lot of it was broken down by stomach enzymes and it was better absorbed by mucous membranes he'd started sniffing it because it was more economical and what that also did was uh, it gets into the bloodstream much faster so you feel the rush and the euphoria more powerfully so what was his objective with this paper did he envisage a world which seems a little bit bizarre to us today, I suppose, where you'd have high functioning, creative individuals being powered by cocaine because in Vienna, this pioneering scholar had shown that it enhanced human capacity. Or as you put it, I think yourself, it allowed um, the nervous system to access untapped reserves of energy. Is that kind of what he's thinking of? Or is it more of, I suppose, a just out of the the pure interest in knowledge. No, it's definitely that. And and cocaine actually at this point is just starting to become a big mass market um, pharmaceutical product. It had been very expensive. It was quite hard to source. It had, you know, the coca leaf only grew in the Andes. and But partly as a result of Freud's work, you know, at this point in the sort of early days of cocaine's boom years, he's often cited as the great medical expert on the subject. And both um, Park Davis Pharmaceuticals in the States and Merck Pharmaceuticals in Germany are starting to to uh, produce more cocaine in the Andes at source. There's much more of it on the market. It's becoming cheaper. It's being advertised as a sort of wonder cure for all sorts of things. There's a lot to take in because um, it's a local anaesthetic already. By this point, it's transforming eye surgery, which used to be impossible. So it's got that application. It's also uh, clears out the sort of bronchial passages. So it's very good for um, catarrh and all those sort of nasal infections. And on top of that, it's this thing that gives you energy so it's like I just suppose the equivalent today of a, a red bull or a double espresso or something like that it's like a sort of pep energy drink and also it's an antidepressant it makes you feel good it lifts your mood so there's an enormous number of uh, doctors starting to use it pharmaceutical uh, company magazines publishing great stories of its cures and efficacy so he sees it um becoming a staple of the pharmaceutical market and something that really increases um, everybody's energy and capacity. And he's not alone in this. There are uh, medical journals are saying this cocaine is exactly what doctors need these days. We have to be alert and firing on all cylinders. We have to have great reserves 
reserves of physical energy and also be mentally acute. This is a very, very good fit with the kind of demands of the medical profession. So it's not just Freud. And one of the reasons I want to capture him at this moment is that, you know, he's at the sort of, he's at really at the peak of his uh, discovery of cocaine before everything starts to go uh, horribly wrong, as it will in the years ahead. Mm. I think it's nice because the chapter you write about this story or the, the section is is titled The New Accelerator. And this idea of acceleration, of speed and things just becoming more intense, it's a really good way to think about the 1880s, mm. 1890s, isn't it? I think so, yes. So... I don't know whether we should take the story a little bit forward, but I mean, let's let's actually linger here for for a moment on this paper. Do you know how well it was received? Uh, did it make a bit of a splash in academic circles? Was it widely circulated? It was. It was very well received, but it had it had very unfortunate consequences. Park Davis Pharmaceutical Company then sort of approached Freud after this to say, would you write endorsement of our product? And they sent him some and Freud tried it and said, yes, this is jolly good cocaine. And having been a medical expert, this tipped him towards being an advocate and somebody who was in the pay of the pharmaceutical companies, uh, which was a, a subtle change in status. But also at this point or very shortly after, People who were uh, working in um, clinics for nervous diseases uh, in Germany started to notice people who were coming to them in terrible nervous states, having been taking large amounts of cocaine, often by hypodermic injection, which was uh, so something that's just coming in in these great these modern pharmacies. You could get your hypodermic needles and syringes and the sort of lovely, beautiful um, machine-tooled kits. And people started to notice after this that cocaine, although it was sort of working wonderfully for some people and advertised to the pharmaceutical by the pharmaceutical companies as such, was also causing terrible nervous and mental uh, problems and Doctors in um, Germany started calling it the third scourge of humanity after alcohol and morphine. So as a result of Freud's early success with cocaine, a lot of fingers started pointing back at him when the problems of uh, uncontrolled cocaine use appeared. Uh, Everybody pointed back at uh, Freud's um, eulogies and advocacy for the drug. Would it be fair to say that even beyond cocaine in the book, there's a bit of a mini, there's a bit of a mini arc to all of these drug discoveries, if I may term them in that way, where you have the pioneers, and you have the early adopters, and you have the enthusiastic use, and then you have the backlash. Is that kind of right? In Definitely, a, in a yeah. And that's also that, that that's a story. The early twentieth century is really where that crystallizes. But I think um, all the way. All the way back, drugs were always uh, viewed with suspicion, certainly opium and morphine. It was quite unusual, you know, even back in the 18th century for... uh doctors to advocate the use of these in an unqualified manner. They were always shaded with medical health warnings and be careful and don't take too much of this. And so that was always present. But cocaine is interesting because it was a substance that more or less appeared from nowhere and was immediately championed by its advocates who had nothing but good things to say for it. And I think that's maybe something where we might look ahead to um, where we are now in the 21st century with, uh, with, with, with psychedelics, you know, with a sort of vogue and a boom that's been driven almost entirely by advocacy and by people sort of telling us their amazing stories of uh, personal transformation. And, you know, there are doubtless, you know, there are now starting to appear other stories which are not quite so benign, where um, people have had terrible outcomes from using psychedelics. But it, uh, in the early stages, I think this is probably true of cocaine as well. Nobody really wants to tell these stories. People say, we're just, you know, this is so important for science that we make this breakthrough if we start harping on about the negative stories that's going to slow everything down Mm, that's an interesting point but in your research when you were working on psychonauts did you come across many cases that that detailed what happened to people because i mean today we live in a world where if you have a drug addiction at least there's a framework of understanding and there are practical measures that you can take you can go to rehab or whatever In the 1880s, there wasn't any of this really available to someone. So 
I imagine as a consequence, people must have ended up, or some people at least, must have ended up in a pretty bad way. Yes, I mean, cocaine is, it's a very easy drug to start using quickly. And I think this is what blindsided Freud, because he's actually was a very sober and cautious young man. He actually had in his dingy little room where we're seeing him, there's a sampler embroidered by his fiancé, Marta, which uh, uh, to brighten up his wall, which says, if in doubt, abstain. So Freud always said, well, I take it in small doses and that's plenty and I never feel the slightest kind of you know craving or urge to take another dose but of course not everybody was as sober and cautious as Freud mm. the famous example from the early days was America's leading surgeon William Halstead who started using it uh, for uh, topical local anesthesia and uh, got together with his students to work out which operations could be uh, uh, improved by the use of cocaine and then they started taking a bit before they went out in the evening and before long Halstead was kind of locked up in his room with uh, you know in his house with enormous quantities of cocaine and wouldn't come out and uh, his friends all had to do an intervention and send him on a cruise with a limited amount of uh, cocaine which he then kind of uh, you know frantically calculated how long it was going to last him and ended up breaking into the captain's office to see if he had any emergency supplies there and he was sent off to a sanatorium which was what happened if you were uh, professional or respectable or wealthy or could afford it. There were lots of sanatoriums for nervous diseases and that's where the first cases of what came to be called drug addiction ended up. Mm, it's a wonderful little story and we're going to move on now but we may well loop back to cocaine <laughs> later on. Let's see. Scene two, where else should we go in 1885? Well, we're going to hop across the Atlantic for this and at the very end of March, March the 31st, we're going to join uh, the philosopher and psychologist William James in his study in Harvard. He's a professor of uh, psychology at Harvard and currently at work on his huge two-volume opus, The Principles of Psychology, which would be the founding text of this new discipline. But today, I think he's, uh, he's musing about about an extraordinary experience he had in 1882 where he uh, inhaled some nitrous oxide and had a mystical experience. So he's writing to a man called Benjamin Paul Blood, who was the person who first suggested that he should try nitrous oxide in the first place. And he's receiving a letter from one of his colleagues in, uh, in, in London who he's uh, conducting these kind of researches with. Well, I should let you take the story forward a little bit because it's very enticing. We have William James here, who's, um, I don't know if he's well known generally, but he's a very prominent um, member of the intelligentsia, let's put it mm -hmm. that way. And nitrous oxide, which people may well know as, I mean, if they'd listened to your 1799 episode where you talked about the initial discovery of nitrous oxide and Humphrey Davy and a little green bag and mm -hmm. the um, effect it had on the, the romantic poets and so on. Um, here we're seeing it the best part of a century later. What does he say to blood? Well, the thing that's happened to nitrous oxide in the interim since uh, Humphrey Davy first experimented with it in 1799 is that it has uh, been part of this great revolution in medicine, the defining triumph of modern medicine, which is um, surgical anaesthesia, ether and Nitrous oxide and chloroform are all now being routinely used in surgical practice. And particularly interesting, I think, for James is it's, uh, it's American. It's, uh, it was America's first great medical scientific uh, triumph on the world stage. Benjamin Paul Blood, like uh, many hundreds of thousands of other Americans, first encountered nitrous oxide at the dentist. And as he came round from his dose of the gas, having had his uh, wisdom tooth removed, had this extraordinarily powerful sensation that he'd somehow seen reality for the first time, that behind the material world, you know, there was this much more fundamental sort of experience that could be had where you would really be kind of one with the universe and understand everything. Blood became fascinated by this. He asked the doctors and dentists about it and they said, oh yes, haha, well, lots of people say that, you know, who knows. Blood wanted to know more. He was a 
He was very interested in philosophy, particularly the idealist philosophy of Hegel, and he started writing pamphlets about his experience. And uh, he insisted, I sent one to William James and insisted that he experiment with nitrous oxide himself, because as he said, this is a different kind of philosophical revelation. It's not a kind you can read about in a book. It's a kind that is readily available, but only in this other state of consciousness that you have to visit. So James uh, did this himself, and he also had had a, a, a very, very powerful mystical experience, which was um, a defining moment for him because he'd never had a mystical experience before. He'd always known about them because uh, his father was a spiritualist, a Swedenborgian and a mystic who wrote long rambling tomes about abstract philosophies and Plato and the absolute and uh, William James had never quite known what to make of these because uh, his father was a you know a great man and he respected him, but it, this all just seemed a bit silly. He didn't get it. So I think as well as um, professionally, uh, then personally, this was a huge moment for James of having a mystical experience and understanding what that meant and how that if you changed your state of mind, your state of consciousness, the world could and reality could appear entirely different. This was something that would go on to become a you know a major fixation with him and the great canonical work of his late life, the varieties of religious experience. He put his nitrous oxide experience right in the middle and said, you know, what it taught me was that uh, our normal waking consciousness is only one particular type of consciousness. And there are all kinds of other states of consciousness, which generate all kinds of other different types of experience. And it's not really fair to say, um, you know, this experience should be disqualified because it was drug induced. It's still an experience. And as James himself proved, you know, even these experiences can be foundational, you know, and uh, you can carry them back into your real life and they can really change your life. So uh, I think that's where uh, that's the path that James is uh, setting out on at this moment. We we have James on the front of Psychonauts, this double exposure, mm-hmm. great sunburst of uh, kind of lurid colours. Um, is this how we should imagine him almost <laughs> on that day in 1885? He's got some dark glasses on as well, which are always pretty cool, I should say. He's he's looking, you know, a very modern figure there. Yes, I mean, modern is another tricky word for us, but we, mm. we won't get into that. Yeah. But is that how we should see him? No, I mean, it's, it's a great photo. He's looking like such a modern hipster. He's got his slouch hat and, as you say, his uh, very cool shades and his sort of baggy outfit. That's actually him... 20 years before this as a young man going off as an expedition to the Amazon, to Brazil. Uh, at that point, he thought he might be a naturalist, but he decided against it. So in a way, that image is slightly misleading because it makes him look like a sort of rugged frontiers man and a kind of outdoor figure. He was actually someone who had very delicate health. He, like Freud, also diagnosed himself with neurasthenia. He had a sort of Maybe a mini nervous breakdown uh, before he... It was a long time before he finally got launched in this career as a psychologist and became a professor. So I think he's actually a much more fragile and diffident figure than he uh, looks on the cover of Psychonauts. And uh, you you said before how Freud's work was influential. More people um, started um, playing with cocaine or experimenting with it after. Was there a similar thing with William James and his, you know, his his researches on nitrous oxide? Did it? Uh, was this something more personal to him, or did he see this as having a wider social impact? Yes, I think it made him an outsider. It made him an outsider in the sort of emerging emerging sort of discipline of psychology, which, as we've mentioned, was much more about brass instruments and reaction times and uh, data gathering and external measurement. Uh, this kind of introspection that he was embarked on um, set him on a particular course. At the time that he's in his study, he's just coming up with maybe the phrase of his that we remember best, which is the stream of consciousness. 
his idea of the mind was that it's very complicated and multi-tracked. There's all kinds of things going on. His, the problem that he had with all this kind of uh, laboratory measurement-based psychology was it was assuming that, you know, thoughts proceeded through our minds in a sort of regular manner, like carriages of a railway train, one after the other. And, you know, his sense was that consciousness was not like that. There's always all kinds of different things going on in our minds, some of which might be very profound and some of which might be very trivial. They might be coexisting and the spotlight of our consciousness is always moving around and there are things on the edge that we're vaguely uh, aware of. So he was, this led him into a type of um, psychology that was much more introspective and much more philosophical and which didn't have an immediate home. With his nitrous oxide experience, for example, he didn't really feel that science was constituted in such a way that it could illuminate what was going on here. But he also didn't regard religion as uh, a useful framework for it. He wasn't arguing that he'd seen God or, you know, had an absolute truth to convey. So he fell in with a group of people, particularly here in in Britain around what was called the Psychical Research Society, who were a group of philosophers and psychologists, mostly based out of Cambridge University, who were interested in these kind of anomalous phenomena when people had precognitive dreams, for example, or near-death experiences, or um, uh, you know, seemed to have proof of uh, you know life after death, um, spiritualism, all these kinds of uh, anomalous experiences that didn't really have a home and didn't really have a scientific explanation. So I think that was where uh, James was led by this experience into a group of kind of insider outsiders. You know, they were um, academic and professorial, but they were sort of working outside their disciplines. Which leads me to another question that I wanted to just ask you now, which is, we've looked at Freud and William James. Is it fair to say that most of these psychonauts were men? Or do you have examples of women who were experimenting on themselves as well? They are almost exclusively men because that's 19th century science for you. I mean, the same question could be asked of 19th century science in general. Where are the women? And uh, answer came there, none largely. Qualifying as a doctor or going to university, these were exclusively male preserves. So I have obviously been very interested whenever any female characters have appeared. And within the sort of scientific context, you get them a little bit at the margins. They're occasionally uh, if you think of someone like James Young Simpson, who was we might think of as uh, Queen Victoria's physician, which he was, who um, he was a pioneer of the use of chloroform in anaesthesia, and of course uh, used it on Queen Victoria in childbirth. Well, he did this with a series of experiments at his own home, where he just had all kinds of. Um, solvents and bottles and uh, sat around the dinner table sniffing them and passing them around and uh, this included his, his niece and his wife so we get little bits of snippets of women as experimental subjects but where we really see women directing their own self-experimentation is outside science and in other areas literature and particularly kind of occultism there are some fascinating women in and around the circles of the order of the golden dawn and wb yates and so on. Yeats was obsessed for many years with a woman called Maud Gonne, who was a fervent Irish nationalist and, like Yeats, deeply immersed in Celtic mysticism and magic. And they used um, hashish and chloroform together for uh, magical rituals and out-of-body experiences. And uh, Maud Gonne, who was an extremely bold and forthright woman and went to jail several times for her political activism, she kind of uh, writes in her memoirs about how she used these drugs to sort of have uh, experiences on the astral plane so we do find these women out there, but even when they do exist, that you know, it's only the very rare cases who will who, who will document that. I mean, I think the risk to a female reputation, even that of you know a very courageous new woman at the end of the nineteenth century, was still such that uh, there were very few who documented it. I was just going to ask you about the James Young Simpson. Was that was he the one? Because there's a wonderful moment in the book when you're talking about the experiments with ether, mm -hmm. which is the the one I would have probably, out of all of your uh, substances, the mm -hmm. one that I would have stayed furthest away <laughs> yeah. from. I think because it gave uh, particularly bad hangovers. Where they all fall, they all drop down. That's down. right. Yeah, no, that, that's in <laughs> fact that, that's the discovery of um, chloroform. Because as you say, ether was what was being used in surgeries. And it's 
it's a bit like sniffing petrol. I mean, it's kind of horrible. And it's, it smells really bad. It's really flammable. It's, a, you know, it's not an ideal substance in many ways. So James Young Simpson was looking for an alternative and uh, he had all kinds of strange solvents which gave him splitting headaches or, uh, you know, damaged his lungs. And eventually he found uh, chloroform and started inhaling it and uh, had that sort of sickly medicinal sweet shop smell to it. So it's better than ether anyway. And he was doing it with a couple of companions and he just heard beside him a sort of thump and thump and the next thing he knew he was looking up at the underside of his mahogany dinner table and they all went well that worked didn't it let's let's try some more <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant okay well let's go to your third scene and see what's waiting for us there yeah well this is towards the end of 1885 and we're down in um, Bournemouth with Robert Louis Stevenson, who has moved down there really for, for his health. You know, he has uh, terrible tubercular and chest conditions, and Bournemouth is a is a great place for sea air and convalescence. So, if you were out on the um, out on the seafront there, you'd see the bath chairs being wheeled up and down, and there are quite a lot of other literary figures there. Interestingly, one person uh, who's there is um, Alice James, Williams' uh, sister, his invalid sister, who is now in a sanatorium there, and she's visited by their brother Henry, Henry James, the novelist, and that's where uh, he and Stevenson meet, and they become best friends. Stevenson and his wife Fanny are um, in the front room of their house with that's a wonderful sea view and he's just written Treasure Island. Uh, there's some sort of piratical knickknacks on the wall and he's lying there mostly bedridden with a uh, sort of table of medicines beside him, all kinds of pharmaceutical preparations, probably including some coca wine. He's just woken up, he'd been woken up by Fanny in the middle of the night having suffering a terrible nightmare and uh, she wakes him up and he complains and says, I was having a dream. I think there's a great story there. And uh, he writes it in uh, three days flat and uh, Fanny reads it and says, no, there's a, there's more to the story than this. This is just a kind of creepy horror tale. I think you, you can go further with this. So he burns it all and then in another three days and nights writes uh, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. If he be Mr. Hyde, he thought, <laughs> then I shall be Mr. Seek. It's one of my favourite uh, lines in literature. Yeah. And it's a, such a magnificent short story, well, a bit longer than a short story, mm-hmm. but it's not too long. And this opens up such an interesting area of um, of the book, really, which is the effect that this culture for self-experimentation had more broadly on literature and the arts and and so on. But let's just talk about um, Stevenson because he did, he in a way suffered like Freud, didn't he, from nervous exhaustion as well as all of his chest complaints. So is he the kind of person who would have had some coca wine available to him at that time? And is, is this the, the sort of thing that could have been picked up from a pharmacy. Yes, it is. And that was the preparation in which uh, uh, coca was most widely available at that time. Thanks to uh, Freud's work, it wouldn't be very long before coca was available as pure cocaine in all kinds of tablets and lozenges. And uh, later on, Stevenson in Samoa uses stronger coca preparations. And he does write at one point, I think if I had an injection of pure cocaine, that would probably sort out my influenza. So uh, he's well aware of it. It, uh, the other interesting drug that he has on his table side is, is, is ergot, ergotine, which is uh, used for, it's a vasoconstrictor that people with uh, who were coughing up blood would use because it would constrict the blood vessels. And But that's also the substance that um, a Swiss chemist in 1930s called Albert Hoffman would uh, tinker around with in a laboratory and uh, produce LSD. So, uh, so yes, that's sort of the drugs of the 20th century are certainly present there. Are there looking at the text itself mm-hmm. um, and knowing what you know about the culture and what was happening during this moment of creation, 
What do you see in Jekyll and Hyde? Do you see any clues or any shades of, of um, psychonaut action? If I <laughs> well, there are so many ways of looking at Jekyll and Hyde as a story, and it's one of those amazingly potent myths and metaphors that can be read many different ways. But if you read it literally, it is about a scientist who's self-experimenting with a drug, with a white powder that turns out to manifest a... Um, sort of dangerous and different sub-personality. So it connects, you know, very much to what Freud is doing in Vienna at this point. Um, but I think it's the shadow side of it. Uh, Freud was always very keen to say that this, that cocaine doesn't make you any different. You know, you're still your sober self. You just, uh, you know, have a bit more energy and a bit more vim about you. But uh, Stevenson is picking up on this idea that actually it might do more than that. It might manifest a second self. And there are drugs that might take people who are normally uh, responsible and respectable and professional and turn them into quite a different character. It was fascinating to many of the sort of scientists and doctors and explorers of the mind, Stevenson's book. William James was particularly fascinated by Stevenson himself because uh, he wrote um, about these... uh, the brownies, as Stevenson called them, these sort of figments of his mind who would operate while he was asleep. And he always said, you know, if I'm thinking about a story and then I go to sleep, then uh, the brownies are always busy at work. And, you know, when I wake up in the morning, they've done the work of, uh, you know, they've constructed a plot for me or they've painted a scene for me much better than I could myself. So there's a lot in Stevenson himself, as well as the story about um, the sort of subconscious mind that the conscious mind may or may not be aware of and may or not be be able to control. And this is the period, of course, when I think um, Fanny Stevenson says at one point that Stevenson had been reading uh, something in a French scientific journal. And this was the period when French neurologists and uh, psychologists were fascinated by hypnosis and double consciousness and the fact that uh, people under hypnosis could you know, manifest quite separate personalities that often when they came round from hypnosis, they were unaware of. So I think... Um, Stevenson's very much part of this dialogue at the time and this moment when people are just starting to conceive the idea of an unconscious mind or a subliminal mind and they're wondering how far this goes. Could we all have a different person inside us who we have no control over? So um, that's uh, I, I think that's where I think Stevenson really engages uh, with the theme of psychonauts. Mm. It's such a fascinating scene because it really opens up all of these questions, deep questions about creativity and the subconscious. Mm -hmm. And these are ones that anyone who's spent any amount of time creating work must have dwelt on where these stories come from and how things can be activated at particular times. And um, I'm I'm, I'm really intrigued by this idea of the, the one person living inside the other person and how to what extent Stevenson believed that might have been a product of this new, what shall I say, drug-induced culture that was sweeping through the country at the time. I'm going to ask you to take the story a little bit forward in conclusion, though, because I think there's a really there's a really fascinating episode in the book when you talk about another Scottish writer, a medical doctor, of course, Arthur Conan Doyle's mm-hmm. creation, of Sherlock Holmes. And a lot of people will know anecdotally, even if they don't know the stories, that that Holmes was a great user of cocaine. And you write, well, you basically trace this thread through the 1880s into the 1890s and so on, which tells a a little bit of a story in itself about how people's attitudes towards drugs and cocaine in particular changed. Do you want to say something about that? Yes, that's right. I think that's a very good way of uh, tracing that and of bringing the various threads in this um, episode to their conclusion, because it tells us uh, what happened to cocaine after Freud's initial uh, sort of enthusiastic endorsement of it. It's just a few years after Jekyll and Hyde, so 1887 through to uh, 1890, when um, Conan Doyle comes up with the character of Sherlock Holmes. It's, it's always been, I think, peculiar for us with hindsight that from the very beginning, Sherlock Holmes is uh, one of his sort of key props is um, the cocaine and the syringe. And I think this is uh, 
partly, you know, he's this he's this metropolitan East seat, a rather Wildean figure, I think, for uh, for Conan Doyle, who practices his uh, detection as a kind of art for art's sake, you know, as well as having his uh, meerschaum pipe and uh, his Stradivarius violin. He's got his uh, his cocaine and his needle, and uh, that's the explanation at the beginning of the. Sign of Four, the first novel that he gives to Dr. Watson for uh, why he's taking cocaine. He says, well, my my mind always needs something to engage with. You know, that's the, uh, that's the reason why I take on these abstruse puzzles and detective investigations is it keeps my mind occupied. And if I'm not doing that, then uh, all I do is uh, have sort of resort to my cocaine. So in a way, cocaine is not just a mere detail. It's actually... Um, Holmes's motivation for being a detective in the first place is to give him something a bit more interesting than just taking cocaine all the time. So it's kind of quite central to his character. But then you can trace through the 1890s how this becomes more and more problematic for uh, Conan Doyle. And he starts mentioning Holmes and his drugs less and less. And then by about 1895, he's um, he hits the big time with the Sherlock Holmes stories and they... Um, start selling into America, into um, Collier's magazine, a very big journal over there. But um, Collier's is also running a sort of consumer campaign against the use of cocaine in patent medicines. And, you know, this is part of the the temperance movement and moving towards what will be the um, Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906, when uh, all these preparations have to have their contents labelled and so on. This starts as a consumer movement in the same pages in which uh, Sherlock Holmes stories are running. Sort of one point, you know, a few years later, then uh, Conan Doyle has to sneak in a little reference by Watson saying, oh, by this time I've managed to uh, cure Holmes of his terrible vice of drugs, which would have been the end of him. And so, you know, he kind of parks it safely in the past. So as we go forward with Sherlock Holmes into the uh, 20th century, he's a he's a drug free character. Well, listen, I think anyone who's following today will realise what a rich and fascinating story Psychonauts tells. It's it's a, a really fabulous work. We've we've covered just a few of the characters today, but in Freud, William James, Robert Louis Stevenson, and then a bit of Conan Doyle at the end. That's that's some uh, very good characters indeed. I've got one last question for you before I let you go today, and that's about tangible history. Is there a memento that you would like from 1885 if you had the ability to pick one up? Well, I think it would be quite nice to uh, go back to Vienna and to Freud's desk to have one of his little branded Merck pharmaceutical vials of cocaine. It could be it could be an empty one. There's uh, more cocaine in 2023 than there was in 1885 around in the world, so there'd be no need to bring any of the substance back. But I've never seen one of those original vials. In fact, I inquired once with archive department of Merck Pharmaceuticals and asked them if they had any, and they said they didn't have any. You'll find various replicas for sale on eBay, but I think it might be nice to have one of Freud's original cocaine vials. Mike J, what a pleasure. It's been great fun. Thank you very much for oh, taking thank the you, time Peter. to come on Travel Through Time. Uh, thanks, it's been a real pleasure.